I think there are broadly speaking two transmission belts for policy. I think one transmission belt is, as it were, the world as it should work, and another transmission belt is to do with the way that the world works in reality. I think the way that sh things should work is that um, policies arise through um, very rigorous and robust processes of analysis, um, investigation of evidence, um, which then leads to the identification of problems and then um, rigorous processes of trying to design policies that can respond to those problems. So in other words, a kind of very coherent, rational series of stages through which the policy making process works. A problem gets identified through this process of looking at evidence and then you put in place a solution to deal with it and then you implement it and evaluate it and so on. I mean I think there are some policies that clearly conform to that process and I think all governments in the last 20 or so years have invested considerably in trying to improve both the quality of the evidence but also how evidence gets used in government and there are lots of examples that I could think of the Troubled Families program for example, the Sure Start program that preceded it where those policies were significantly shaped by analysis and investigation of evidence. On the other side, I mentioned that there were two transmission belts. I think the other transmission belt is a more political one. The truth is that some policies arise because of individual politicians and ministers coming up with ideas. Um, some of those ideas are better than others. Um, I wouldn't say that you know, the political um, ministerial policy making route is necessarily worse, it's just different. Um, but it tends to arise more through, as I say, ministers having ideas. Sometimes those are provided through think tanks. Sometimes they come through more informal conversations or meetings. Again, I would say a change that I think has taken place in government since I was around government and the civil service is that I think British government has become much less insular. Um, certainly 30 or 40 years ago, you would have spoken about the idea that in British government, the civil service has a monopoly over the policy process. Now, I think that was always exaggerated to some extent, but I think it's true to say that in perhaps the last 20 or even 30 years, um, the role of the civil service in policy making has um, changed to some extent, and you now see many more actors involved in the policy process, think tanks, NGOs, civil society organisations, management consultants, of course, of course, have become very significant players. And I think all of these actors are clearly providing um, ideas to ministers, sometimes on a more informal basis. And I think that's another means by which um, policy ideas get seeded in government and then come through the process. So as I say, I think there's very much an evidence-led route, which is more formal, more con conforms more to the rational model of policy making, but then there's also a more political policy making route, which some people are perhaps critical of, but I think is inevitable that ministers will generate their own ideas with their advisors through, as I say, these more informal networks and contacts. Yeah, I mean, I think the Westminster model was obviously, or has been, one of the most important, influential ways in which we thought about British politics. You know, based around, I suppose, a, a, a relatively straightforward idea that um, the way that the um, government process, the way that policy making works in Britain is that um, the process of government is controlled normally by a single party um, working in Westminster in a relatively centralised way, um, coming up with policy and then enacting it um, through... Uh, parliamentary sovereignty and through centralised political institutions. I think the core of those assumptions have obviously eroded significantly over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, part of that is obviously to do with developments like devolution, which have obviously meant that power has been passed away from Westminster to new sites of power in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, London, and now of course increasingly some of the larger English cities. So that, I mean, that clearly erodes the assumption in the Westminster model that through controlling the levers of power in Westminster, you can make policy change happen. You're now dealing with, in reality, a whole series of devolved centres of power, uh, which make the policy making process somewhat different. I think there's also a debate about Parliament. I think, again, the Westminster model, as I mentioned, has within it a very strong notion of parliamentary sovereignty as being the key principle through which you govern and make policy. Um, that has obviously eroded again for a whole series of reasons. There is a debate about the Europeanisation of politics and policy making and the impact of being an EU member, which is, of course is going to change again when Britain, uh, as it's expected to, leaves the European Union um, in the next few years. Um, and I also think that um, there has been a challenge to uh, 
the Westminster model's assumption that it's only really ministers and senior civil servants who make policy. Um, that you see, as I mentioned before, the introduction of many more kinds of actors. Um, some of those actors are more civil society based. Some of them are, as it were, more corporate or private sector orientated. Um, but I think all of this um, you know, shatters the illusion that policy is just made by um, a very small elite. I think in some respects the elite is still able to control some of the most important channels of policy making, but to some extent I think these old elitist networks have been broken up and that's changed the nature of the policy process and certainly, again, I think raises big questions about the traditional notion of the Westminster model as being the best way to understand how government works in Britain.